Hello, everyone. It's two o'clock, so let's get started. I hope everyone can hear us clearly. Today, we are doing our webinar, Selling Your Home 101, presented by Marie Bonville. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact us directly at nlcinfo at semtribe.com, or you can call our number at 954-985-2315. Uh, today, uh, the web facilitator will not be Alyssa Atkins. It is I, Lewis Porter Jr. I am the marketing coordinator for the Native Learning Center. Uh, if you ever if you ever go to our website, that's what I'm in charge of. So I'm sure you've seen our stuff. A disclaimer: This webinar provides a summary of fundamental concepts, requirements, and/or procedures within the allotted 90 minutes. Then the material discussed does not illustrate all possible scenarios that can be applicable. How to interact during the presentation? Use the hand tool at the top of the screen to select things like raise hand, agree, disagree, applaud, laugh. And as you see the screen right here, this shows you where um, all of our information is available. Currently, we have Selling Your Home uh, 101 PDF that is available for our downloads. Today's survey at the end of the training will be in our survey area. And of course, we have a chat bar where you can put information in of what's going on or if you have any questions you might have. Today, of course, like I said, our webinar is Selling Your Home 101 with Marie Bonneville. So let me turn it over to her and she can go from there. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Lewis. I appreciate the warm introduction and thank you to everybody in the room. We're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to talk about. Um, so first, uh, if everyone wants to go ahead and put their name, um, the organization they work with, um, and no worries, Marianne, uh, if you could just put your name where you work and, um, you know, if you currently own a home, I think that would be helpful to me to be able to kind of direct my talk in the direction that might benefit you the most. Um, Hold on one second. I'm also going to pull out my presentation so that it's easier for me to navigate. So while you're doing that, just bear with me. Um, all righty. Okay, awesome. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started and talk about Selling Your Home 101. A little bit about me. As Lewis said, um, I am an instructor um, uh, providing information for the Native Learning Center today, but I used to work for the Native Learning Center um, as the Director of Training and Technical Assistance. Um, and this was a part of um, the benefit that I received was just working with all Native communities throughout the country to promote home ownership. Um, I currently own Sunlight Armor Homes, which is a residential and remodeling um, company, uh, as well as an, a realty group. And so, you know, I encompass all that is home ownership. I love, um, you know, working with both buyers and sellers um, and facilitating that education component. When I work with Native communities, primarily it's on home ownership education um, and training their staff so that we can make sure that our our borrowers are qualified. Um, and so it's been a, a, an honor to work in this industry for so long. Um, I am a wife and a mother of two, and I reside in Ackworth, Georgia. Um, but legit, yesterday I was in South Dakota um, at, at the you know, with the Crow Creek Reservation working um, to promote home ownership. And so it's a labor of love um, and I'm thankful to be here. Um, as far as today's course description goes, um, it goes without saying that I know in Native communities, you know, our primary focus is building home ownership. Um, within our communities, I know that, you know, supply and, and the building of these homes, um, the costs have just continued to increase. But this is the largest um, investment that, that our our clients will make, right? And so, you know, there's this big discussion about generational wealth and, you know, when is it a good idea that an, a homeowner think about selling? We're in that latter part of the of the of the conversation. We're in that that 
that piece of the puzzle needs to be included into our discussion with our clients, I think, moving forward, just because, you know, there may be a need to sell their home. There may be, you know, a need to pay for college or pay for metal expenses or um, potentially tap into that equity. And we want to make sure that they're understanding the why behind it. So it's a little bit of um, just balance in knowing, you know, what why do you need to sell your home? What would be some of the reasons to sell a home and, and what the process might look like? Um, we're also trying to prevent them from getting taken advantage of because there's a lot of predatory, um, you know, individuals out there that solicit homeowners when they're vulnerable. So um, this is more so protecting our existing homeowners from that element as well. Um, our course objectives, certainly we want to talk about the why. What's the motivation behind moving, selling a home, and um, whether or not it's for them or not? These are the kind of things that they would need to think about as they grow within their home. Conditions. Certainly, you know, we hear a lot of, you know, frustration amongst the housing authorities or the housing departments, you know, where uh, homeowners aren't familiar with the roles or responsibilities that they need to have, like what do they fix versus what do they call, you know, uh, to have fixed by the tribe? So the argument is, well, typically, you know, the motivation behind fixing a home or repair or maintaining a home is be is for the purpose of resale, right? You want to keep the value of the home up. Um, and so that's another angle to look at this um, and, and be able to convey that to our clients. There's another set of conditions we got to talk about, right? And that's housing market conditions, like the if you're in an urban setting, right, and we do have native native um, members that are in urban settings, then they need to understand what market conditions um, would look like for them if they're choosing to sell, right? So at U.S. professionals, this will help you in, in, in guiding them. And then also to understanding how much to sell your home for, right? The, the list price itself. Um, you know, where do they get this number from? When you go to Zillow, um, Trulia, or any of these other, uh, you know, web-based services where you're getting information on homes for sale, you know, there's typically a list price and then there's what the home should sell for, right? Um, so what does that look like and where do they get these numbers? We'll talk about that. And then lastly, seller responsibilities. So you as the seller of your home, there are things you need to do in order to sell the home. It could be that a loan product, right? your buyer might come to you with a product that requires repairs. So we also want to remind our sellers that when they're in this process, there's things they got to be they, they got to take into consideration. So what you might have missed um, is that I recently did a couple other homeownership webinars that might be of interest to you. Um, the first one was housing market. It talked about, um, you know, the native community and housing and the disconnect that we we had in regards to uh, the loan products and the ability to build on reservation, build home ownership both on reservation and off. Um, we talked about the home buying process, right? What does it look like for our borrowers? Um, and then also protecting that investment. So working with a licensed professional, like individuals who are using general licensed contractors what, or versus a, a handyman, right? What? How do you know when to use the right person for the job? Um, this is what's going to pr protect their investment um, in the long run. And so when we're talking about post-purchase training, these are the types of elements we want to include you know, how to work with a professional, how to read a scope of work, things like that. We talked about the housing market. Um, and basically, you know, 2008, if we remember that, you know, there were real financial issues, right, with the system. Um, some of this is completely outside of our control. But in 2000, anybody who purchased a home in 2000, in the early 2000s knows that they they didn't have that basic homeownership education, myself included. I purchased a home Mm, August of 2007. And the Great Recession started um, in February of 2008, right? So, you know, did I have the basic homeownership education skills necessary to navigate my, my payment, you know, uh, adjusting? I had an arm. I didn't even know what that meant, you know, in all honesty. So, meaning education is the key. This is what we want our future home buyers to know and have the knowledge. You know, we we I want them to stay in their home for as long as humanly possible, but I also understand that it's an asset. And so we need to teach them about, you know, when is the right time to refinance? That was a key. Um, we'll talk about that. When is the right time to sell your home? And and when that happens, what should you look out for? So we also have the, the benefit of technology at our fingertips. So our new homeowners, uh, potential homeowners have way more information and it might not always be accurate, right? Um, so helping them navigate this process 
um, with the, the right tools and technology is also, you know, what I'm advocating for. June is National Homeownership Month, so I feel very excited to bring all these topics to you in the middle of my favorite month of the year, it seems. But um, I also have some announcements. You know, if you're not familiar with the Native American direct loan, it's it's essentially mirrors the, v, the regular VA loan in that this is specifically for our Native American veterans um, to be able to use off or on the reservation. Um, but it it was um, driven by the market rate. So our native veterans would basically, whatever the interest rate is today would be what they would get locked in for. As of right now, the Department of Veterans Affairs announced in March that they will reduce that rate to 2.5% um, for the next two years. So it's not currently something that will remain that way, but for two years, our native veterans could um, lock in a 2.5% interest rate, making home much more affordable for them. And after the service that they provided to our country, it's only only fair that we promote this and give them that information um, as much as we can. So that's, that's a little bit of news about that. And I've provided the link if you want more information. Um, the second thing is Section 184. Most of us are aware that Section 184 is a loan product that can be used on or off reservation for Native American peoples. So what you need to know here is that last week they put out an announcement that as of Ju July 1st, uh, the PMI, the private mortgage insurance, will, the fee itself will be reduced from 0.25% to 0%. Um, additionally, the guarantee fee, so the loan fee that is uh, charged will be reduced from 1.5 to 1%. Doesn't sound like a whole lot, but in, in, in trying to make home affordable, the the current interest rate, and I looked this up earlier. Let me make sure I get this right. The current interest rate is as of today is 7.08%. So, you know, when we're talking about affordability, think about that payment and just having those percentages reduced means your borrower's payments will be that much less. So that's a good thing. And last but not least, native uh, a new Native American home loan product. So Freddie Mac announced last week that they are going to create a new home ownership loan product um, called Heritage One, uh, and it's intended to boost home ownership rates in Native communities. Specifically, they they really chose to drill down and work closely with um, on reservation, right? So tribal lands and rural areas surrounding the nations. So that's huge because hopefully they see the impediments to home ownership, the lack of building materials and structures and, you know, infrastructure necessary. You know, you're paying that much more to have the materials move to you, to your locations, et cetera. And, you know, if, if you're talking manufactured housing, driving that home from wherever it's being built to the reservation could mean the difference of a home being affordable or not. So just these types of things, um, these announcements are huge. So, a bit. Thank you. If you heard it, yes, uh, I think I announced it on Tuesday, but I want as many people to know about these changes as possible. Um, so according to the Urban Institute, they put out a report in 2021 that real estate accounts for 70% of all generational wealth in the United States. This means that for most families, their home is their most important asset. Um, and for example, to, you know, I pulled this other statistic that says, um, as of April 2023, the median sales price of a home is $388,000. Um, that's it's down from last year, so thankfully that price has gone down some, but it, it's still pretty high for most um, Native communities and most uh, of our individuals who are seeking their first time home home ownership opportunity, right? So. Um, how do we build generational wealth or how does real estate build generational wealth? Um, the first is tax breaks, right? So if you're on reservation, um, you can still deduct your mortgage interest. If you're off reservation, you can deduct your mortgage interest and your property taxes from your federal income taxes. So that gives you more, what, disposable income? That's just That just means more money in your pocket, right? It increases borrowing power, right? So you don't always have to look to um, a credit card or um, selling items. You could maybe tap into that home equity that you have. That The equity of your home is just the portion of, of the home that belongs to you, where you've paid into it. Um, increased savings. Homeowners are more likely to save money because they are vested in the interest of maintaining the property. Going back to making sure we, we let our homeowners understand that value of maintenance um, is a huge factor in this. Um, 
And then also too, um, I like to think about, I mean, if you're not familiar with housing or you're new to housing, some of these terms might go over your head. So I like to just use some examples. When you make a mortgage payment, you know, if you're on reservation, you don't have taxes, but you do have insurance. Insurance is required by this by the lender. So there's not there's no real uh, pr protection there in case just in case something happens. Right. That's the that's the protection. But think about the first part. You've got principal interest. We talked about taxes and insurance, but that principal and interest. What is that? Principal is the money that goes right into your pocket. Interest belongs to the bank. That's the cost of borrowing the money. Every month you're putting money in your own pocket. That's how you should see your mortgage payment. Yes, there's a portion of it that goes to taxes or a portion of it that goes to insurance and a portion of it that goes to the bank. But there's a portion of it that goes right in your pocket. So that's an that's a automatic savings account that you have that you're building each month. So why does that increase financial security? Because homeowners are less likely to, to experience hard, financial hardship. Um, they have a bare minimum. They have a place to live uh, that they own outright. And so what happens is that money starts to grow over time. And the, the money in your pocket starts to grow. You start paying the bank less and less in interest, and you start growing that pocket of yours that you can tap into later if you need. Um, the other thing is banks don't like foreclosure. Contrary to what people think, um, it's, it's time consuming, it's labor intensive, and it's um, financially, it, it, it costs a lot of money for them to, to um, facilitate a, a foreclosure. So banks don't like foreclosures. They want to work with people to, um, to protect their homes. So you can think about it, 30, 60, 90 days late on a, on a home, home loan. Um, that's still a person staying within their home, even if they're in financial hardship, um, in which case they just need to work with the bank to, to, to modify that. Right. But what I'm trying to get at is that this is how this generational wealth you know, begins. Um, the other argument is, you know, why do the wealthy stay wealthy? Because they don't have to start all over, right? When you have a home and there's a there's a need within the family, they can choose to access or tap into um, the, these funds. So that's another way of looking at it. So this is typically what our clients are are used to, right? When they think selling a home, buying a home, they look to these shows that they watch on TV. The one I'm going to highlight is called Love It or List It. How many of you have watched that show? Let's see here. How many of you have watched Love It or List It? You can put it in the chat area there. Um, but essentially, the premise of the show is that you have a homeowner that has a need, right? That need could be that their family has grown out of the space or that they um, are, are maybe old, you know older and looking for a master on the main, right? Their, their master bedroom's upstairs and they need something downstairs. And so the argument is, well, do I renovate my home or do I list my home and purchase a new one that has the things I want, right? So everybody says, let's see, Marianne says, my mom does, she's big on TLC. Uh, Allison Casanova says, I watch it all the time. Okay, so you know if we're watching it, our clients are watching it, right? So we have to do, you know, our due diligence to kind of let them know what's what's real and what's not so real. So the real part is there is a need, right? This family does need to make a change. When it's time to list the home, you know, they are weighing, well, how much more will it cost me to make the renovation versus purchasing a new home and that payment amount? What they're not showing you, uh, you know, on, on the screen is whether or not it's cost effective for them, right? So maybe they purchased their home and the interest rates were 4%. And now if they purchase if they buy a new home, that house might, uh, that interest rate might be, as I said before, 7%. So is that going to be better for the family or worse? We don't know their financial circumstances. And that's the key element missing from these shows. Um, so a dose of reality, I think, is what we want for our clients. Um, NativeHomeOwnershipIsPossible.com, excuse me, um, is a place that you can have you know, send your clients if they want videos on, you know, people who've gone through the process, both on and off reservation. Um, it also, as practitioners, if there's people who are wanting to know more about, you know, homeownership education tools and things like that, the South Dakota Native Homeownership Coalition has resources. And so I just put that out there in case anybody's interested. But, you know, essentially, we've got to lay the groundwork. This is why, even though we talk about spending plans in, in, the homeownership class, we have to talk about it as a post-purchase 
reality as well. People need to be saving for renovation, for remodel, for repair. Um, they have to choose qualified professionals. These types of things matter. And qualified professionals don't come out if you don't have the money, right? That's one of the things that you see in, in the in that show is that they're always trying, you know, trying to figure out how much money they can get, how much work they can get for the money, right? So that's part of it. They got to make sure they have a plan for their money because um, if, if you don't tell your money where to go, you'll wonder where it went, right? It's really important that they're planning and they're budgeting and that they're saving. And these skills are are kind of, as far as education is concerned, we kind of, we're happy they got the house and then they're on their own, right? <laughs> we don't really, you know, have a whole lot of energy behind post-purchase. And I completely understand why from a capacity perspective and the amount of, you know, people you have to oversee within your your housing authority. But I do think it's worth, you know, trying at least in in June, right? Home ownership month plan for next year and come up with ways that you can give your homeowners um, the types of tools that they'll need. Because, you know, whether they choose to do it online or not, the reality is, I mean, I have online banking and I have uh, e-statements. And even myself, I find it hard to check my bank statements because they're e-statements and I know they're there. I take them for granted, right? And I don't do maybe as much as I could to to balance my spending um, and reconcile as much as I should. So and if that's me, and it's probably many of you, and certainly our homeowners who are just, you know, navigating life and doing other things, they're not in home ownership every day, right? The uh so the top seven reasons to sell your home, let's we're gonna talk about the why of it all. The first is growing families. Certainly you might need more space. Um you know, the other element is that you might be an empty nester. And so you're trying to downgrade, right? You, it's too much home for you. And the cost of maintaining the home might be too much for our, our older uh, members. So thinking about it from that perspective, sizing up or sizing down, you might need to sell your home. Um, maybe the tribe is starting, is, is developing a new elder 55 and older community. There's there, certainly, you know, in urban settings or, or, non-rural settings, you'll see 55 and older communities that may, may, may make more sense for um, your, your clients so that there's a reason to sell there. Of course, relocation, um, as I mentioned, our Native veterans who serve dis, you know, disproportionately more than you know, other um, ethnicities, relocation is a big one for them um, as far as working um, and being in the military. Um, job changes, but job changes, ha changes happen all the time. Career opportunities exist in which that takes you to a different place or space. Um, and then your personal circumstances, they just, they might change and take you to a different city, state, or country. So thinking about these things, it might be a, a burden to, to, right? You might say, okay, well, I don't want to sell. I'll just move to this new place. Financially, that could lead to a burden, but what else? I know that when I moved from Hollywood, Florida to, um, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Ackworth proper. When I moved here, I thought, well, sure, I'll just keep my house in Hollywood. That became harder and harder to do. It's not for everyone um, as far as, you know, maintaining a home or, or renting a home that those skill sets may not be for everyone. And so I decided to sell the home because it was just too much of a hassle. Another reason to leave. Um, we saw this in 2020 for sure. Lifestyle changes, right? What happened in 2020? People realized, wow, I don't have to live in New York City, NYC proper to do my job here in Florida. You know, yeah, I can move anywhere. Um, I can move to where it's more cost effective for me, right? I can move from an urban area to a suburban or even a rural area. As long as they've got Wi-Fi, I'm good, right? If they've got broadband, um, moving from suburban areas to rural er areas happen as well. Um, you see it with our youth. They tend to say, okay, I've tried this and now I want to go visit, you know, the, the, the nearest city and see what that's about um, for, for various reasons, education, um, nightlife, whatever the case is. Um, so, you know, lifestyle changes have an impact as well. So this lady looks kind of stressed and I, I didn't mean to say that financial factors are always stressful. Um, there are times when you want to tap into uh, this, the sell of your home because uh, you want to do something good, right? Maybe you want to pay for a, a, a family member's education or assist them. Of course, you'll keep some money behind for your own down payment on a new home. But the argument is you sell your home, a portion of it will go towards your, new, your next down payment. A portion of it might go to your son or daughter or whomever. Um, maybe they're wanting to start a, a small business. Maybe they're that you have some medical expenses you want to pay off, et cetera. 
So there are reasons that, hey, not necessarily stressful, but something that prompts you to decide to sell the home. Um, of course, reducing debt, avoiding foreclosure, those more you know intense and stressful you know environments may require you to to think about selling your home. But I think for us, it's about knowledge being power and letting sure making sure that our homeowners know what's available to them before they go down this road. Going back to predatory lending, um, there's a lot of folks that pay attention to what's going on. And the moment they see some sort of proceeding or filing um, within the city or county when it comes to um, a foreclosure, they, they're quick to pounce and say, I'll, I'll pay you pennies on the dollar for this house, right? And, and so a, a stressed person might take that offer versus or I might sell to Open Door or to Zillow or some other entity that um, seems like a quick fix. And I'm not taking, you know, I'm I am not advocating not to use them. I'm just saying that each individual person, you know, might be best working with their housing authority, with their housing department. You know, someone who who's who's got the housing counseling mindset to be able to help them make a better decision for them. The other argument is, and we have. Um, such a spread in within our community in terms of individuals who also live in areas where it might be better for them to purchase new construction versus uh, an existing structure, right, or existing home. If you're from South Florida, then you know that you know some of these homes were built in the 40s, 50s, 60s. They're hurricane proof. That much I know. But other things, other elements, electricity, uh, plumbing, you know, there are a lot of elements that may not be up to code, up to standards. And so in today's standards, at least. And so the argument is, well, maybe I should just go ahead and purchase a new home. Right. So of the upgrade factors there, you know, people want to go from an actual farmhouse to modern farmhouse living. Right. So just thinking about that um, as a reason to move is, is, is a real one. And then, of course, life events. Right. And this could be marriage. Right. Two people deciding to come together and, you know, keep it, maybe they both have homes and one needs to sell and one is moving into the, the other one's home. Um, of course, starting a family, adding um, family members to the home um, in our communities. It's not just, you know, your immediate family, but it's cousins, brothers, sisters, aunties, you know, whoever. So it could be that you're adding these individuals to the home. Um but also the passing of a loved one, right? Maybe they they stayed in the home, they passed, and now it's time to decide what to do with the home. Maybe you know the sisters, the siblings decide that it's it's best to sell it, right? Um, think divorce. Um, in that particular case, each person wants to divide their asset and move on with life, right? So it just depending on the life event, it also may prompt the sell of a home. Um, and of course, it provides financial flexibility because some folks may decide that it's better for their lifestyle, right? They're going to move into that 55 and older community that the tribe just built and, and you know, and leave the maintaining of a home to another person um, outside of, of their immediate family. Because sometimes it's about not wanting to be a burden to your family either, right? Um, and, and having to, to do all of that work. So um the other reason to sell that you hear about often is like the market is hot, right? We'll talk a lot about that today. You'll see, you know, what that looks like, what the dynamics behind that are, um, because, you know, just because the market is hot, hot doesn't mean you sell your home, right? Um, there are other factors you have to take into consideration. You might sell your home, but where are you going to go? If prices are so high, it may not be to your benefit. So we'll We'll balance that out um, with some some percentages and things that I think will help make a more informed decision. Any questions so far about any of that? Um, go ahead and put it in the chat area and I'll definitely monitor the chat area as we move forward. But now we're moving past the why, the reason to sell, and we'll talk about the housing market and what it means um, as far as interest rates, right? What is the motivation when you see interest rates um, both rising and falling? And how does that affect the sale of a home? So I'm going to point out a few things here, but this is essentially your interest rate, your average 30-year rate in America from year 1975 to 2022. And so first thing I'm going to point out is that 1981 is the highest year on record. It's right here. It was 16.63%. So when people are griping about 7% now, I like to pull this little uh, chart out. No, I'm joking. Um, I do think that, you know, people were purchasing homes back then as well. Interest rates do rise. 
But what you will see in this chart is a connection between interest rate and, and interest rates and inflation. There is a connection there, and it's just, you know, you don't need to be an economist to know that. So in the 80s, inflation was high. As a result, interest rates were high. As inf inflation comes down, so do the interest rates. Um, now, when we get to the 2000s, you've got, you know, dot com, you've got, you know, a lot, a lot of deregulation in the market. It's making it easier for people to purchase homes. Financial instruments are being put in place where people are purchasing more homes um, and times are good. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but that leads to 2007, 2008, and eventually the Great Recession. So that deregulation, no education, home ownership education, people providing stated incomes, basically saying they made a certain amount and not necessarily showing any backup documentation. These types of things just help to uh, uh, create the 08 crisis. The, they call it the Great Recession. Um, during the Great Recession, there were a lot of reforms that took place. The Dodd-Frank Act, there are a lot of things that help to protect our consumers now from from you know just being able to know more about what they're signing up for, right? When they when they get a home loan, um, and so you know, if I have anything to thank, I, the loan estimate and the closing disclosure, you know, I have 2008 to thank for that. But also too, um, as far as interest rate rates go, they start to decline, and the reason why is that we're starting to see folks struggle, um, and the Fed, federal, the Federal Reserve. Their role is to kind of think supply, think blood supply, right? So, you know, there's, you you want to try to have as much energy within the market as possible, right? So when you're working out, your blood is flowing and pumping. Th think of that. So when they lower interest rates, when the Fed does that, it, it makes it to where the economy can move and people can spend more and it, it, that you just get that energy, that boost of energy from from that that decrease in, in interest rates. However, um, what we saw in 2020, let's get there. So it was 3.10. Okay, fine. By 2021, it was 2.96. That's the lowest on record um, for any year. So um, interest. When people say, "Oh, I missed my, I missed my my chance," you know, I I would argue that's really an outlier. That is not the normal. Um, the norm, right? Was it a good time? Sure. To refinance. Like for example, if you purchased your home in 2000 and it was 8%, should you have refinanced in 2021 or 2022, early 2022? Sure. Should you still refinance? Probably because you're at 7%. But what my argument is just, you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't know to do these things, to pay attention to these things, you're not able to make better financial decisions for your family, right? So Another thing about 2020, it was just an outlier. The Federal Reserve was like, look, we're supposed to stay in place, right? What is it? Shelter in place. Um, I need people spending money. So the best way to do that is to lower interest rates. Now, when they, when you hear that the Fed is lowering rates, it doesn't immediately affect mortgage rates. It takes some time, but eventually those rates do come down. And the converse is true. If they say that they're in, increasing interest rates, uh, I think yesterday they said they're keeping it the same. But Let's say they, they said they were going to raise it. Well, we, we in the mortgage industry might not see that impact for a couple weeks um, because those rates are, are, are not exactly the same. But um, any questions about that? I just wanted to bring that up because I think this chart definitely shows you why it's important. This is something you can bring up to your homeowners to say, this is why we want you to understand, even though now that you're in your home, there are times when it makes more sense to come back to us talk to us about um, about your current financial situation when it comes to your home. So what are people concerned about, right? Because the home is much more than just a financial thing, right? The, this thing we make payments on. Um, people are concerned about the fact that right now the mortgage rates are high. Again, I, 2020 was an outlier. Um, so will interest rates go back down? Eventually it will, as you can see, it does happen, but the, our clients just need to be ready for that moment when it happens. Um, does that mean they shouldn't move into home ownership? I don't think that that's, that should be the only factor. Inflation right now, inflation, it, you know, it started to rise. They, remember they pumped all this money into the economy. Inflation starts to rise. Inflation itself, a good way to think about it is a basket of goods. If I buy 
five things from Publix or any uh, my grocery store. And a year later, I buy those exact same five things. How much more is it going to cost me? That's inflation, right? If I see that there's a huge increase, then that means the power of my money, you know, has has lessened. I don't have I'm not getting as much for what I used to. Right. That's a super simple, <laughs> simplified version of it. I'm not an economist. I'm just trying to show you how people are concerned about inflation because it is happening. Right. If anybody followed eggs. Oh my gosh, on Facebook and Instagram, all we ever talked about was how much more eggs cost in the last year and a half. So think about it from that perspective. Um, the lack of inventory. We don't have enough houses for the people who need houses. That's just what that's both, you know, in native communities specifically, sure, but also across the country, that's just the case is that we don't have enough inventory. And we'll look at some graphs that show you why. Um, and then qualified construction professionals. So when we talk about the fact that we don't have enough housing, we need people to build them. Back in the 2000s, early 2000s, you started to see the trade uh, trade schools kind of dwindle. Everybody was pushed to do these four and two and four year degrees. I'm not advocating one was better than the other. I just know we have a huge gap now in the number of qualified professionals. A lot of our guys are retiring um, making it even harder to get apprenticeship opportunities out there. And so you are seeing that um, by way of a lack of inventory. So one is connected to the other. Other indicators. So U.S. housing professionals, and I didn't always know this. I mean, when I first started working with the Seminole Tribe and, and, and the Native Learning Center specifically, I didn't always understand, you know, how interest rates, unemployment, income growth, right, how these things play into a, a, the decision to buy or sell. I didn't understand housing supply. I didn't know, you know, when, you know, what economic growth looks like. You know, now we talk about community development all the time, but it wasn't always apparent. Birth rates, right? That can mean that you as housing professionals can anticipate what your clients might need in the future um, and make decisions based on that. And then also policies. So housing is a market and these things aren't for your sellers. Uh, we'll, we're going to talk about the sellers here in a minute, but I want to give you an understanding of the things that will help you all um, in the future to watch these things as they go, right? So in 2016, um, essentially 6% of the population, 75, if you were 75 and older, you were 6% of the population. So not much, right? They estimate by 2050, you're, we're going to have them be 13% of the population. What's that going to mean for home ownership? Uh, you're probably going to have more multi-generational families, people living with each other uh, so that they can lower the costs, especially if these individuals don't have, you know, huge retirements to rely on. Um, you know, what else does that mean? It means the types of construction, the types of homes that they're going to need. They're a larger part of, part of the population. They're probably going to need stepless ranches, right? Masters on Main, you know, it, it, places for them to go where they can live, you know, and, and be comfortable. Look at the median age of home buyers, right? So in 1981, a first time home buyer was 29. Today, a first time home buyer is 36. So that's a huge jump. Something to consider when you're looking at the type of education programming that you put on. Um, you know, they're much older. Um, and then also to think about your uh, repeat buyers, right? So a repeat buyer, if we look at 2021, that's a huge gap. In in at 33 years old, you know, they're they're already they bought their house at 29, and at 33 they're already selling it, right? The loyal it gets a, it could be a lot of things, right? We don't have as much job loyalty as we used to. People don't stay for a long period of time in one place. They kind of move around some, so it could be employment that's driving that. But what else? You know, um, it could be that they're making decisions based on what's, you know, they're much more knowledgeable, as I said before, than, you know, previous home home buyers. The other thing is, if you look at 2021 and that repeat buyer experience, 56 is that number of repeat. So they, they're not a first time home buyer. They purchased homes before. So now you're 56 and you're you're starting over. That's probably due to retirement, not having the same level of income. Um, or wanting to make a change as far as your lifestyle is concerned, moving into a 55 and older community, for example. Um, we didn't really have those types of um, places, you know, we didn't have as many 
you know, I know everyone says, well, all of Florida is 55 and older, but I'm saying that across the country now, there are just many, so many more options for, for individuals who are looking to scale back. But I will say many of them are very expensive as well, um, those, those developments. Um, housing production, talking about supply again, here's a graph that just says, look, as a population, even though we're growing, so look at 2009, you know, at when we were, weren't growing a whole lot, you know, um, it still meant that we were behind the amount of production on, on, a, on homes that we needed, right? It, it was a huge dip because no, you know, no one was really buying back then. And, and rightfully so, uh, that crash, you know, it starts to rise. Okay, fine. But where are we today? You know, well, in this case, as of 2020, you can see that the demand for housing is there, but that the supply hasn't grown with it. The other element to that is this. It used to be starter home, three bedrooms, maybe two bedrooms, one bath, three bedrooms, two bath, that type of thing. But the number of constructed homes below 1,400 square feet is, it just dwindled, right? To the point where it doesn't, it doesn't meet it anywhere near the levels it used to. Um, why is that? You know, these four and five and six bedroom homes, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but now you have a group of people who are saying, well, wait a minute, what happens when the home is too much for me, right? And I need to sell. Um, also too, I think that this is spearing this tiny home um, revolution <laughs> uh, uh, from, from the idea that I can't afford the homes that are being built today, right? They're just, they're just way too big. So um, the average sale price of homes, you know, starting from, let's go back to 2000 and let's see, 10 here, you can see there's a little dip and that's the great recession kind of repairing itself. But since 2010, uh, you've seen a, a steady um, incline, right? And then in 2020, it's, it jumps, right? It jumps from, let's see, what is that? A little under 400,000 to 450. And then by 2022, we're looking at, you know, an average of 555, right? Um, so the argument is, and this is, this is in thousands, right? So $500,000. So the question is, well, why? The, the pandemic meant that new homes, and this is new homes, not existing homes. So remember going back to that 388, that's existing homes. But for your new builds, it's costly. It's very expensive for, for folks. So selling your home in 2020, 2021, 2022 um, was a little different. Um, for me as an agent, what I saw was you've got one house, we're supposed to shelter in place, and I've got five buyers. The buyers are kind of like, I don't know what's going on, but I, I know I'm ready. I guarantee you that most of these buyers were ready for home ownership at least two, three years before 2020. They just didn't have the motivation to move. Interest rates and uncertainty pushed them into the market. And by doing that, it created a bidding war. One house, I'd have 15 offers. Um, there's this thing called days on market. It's the number of days it takes. Like once you list it, it's the number of days it takes for you to go under contract. And legit, our days on market was like two and three days. It was insane. It wasn't normal. Um, but it drove prices up. So going back to that one one graph, I lived that. You know what I mean? I know what that looks like. And it looked like chaos. You know, you'd pull up to a house and there's 15 cars out front, everybody waiting to get in. 2023, things have slowed. The Fed have, again, going back to inflation, the, the, you know, they're trying to fight inflation. And so it's a little trickier because now prices have come down some. You know, you could argue people... If you were selling, interested in selling your home, what did you do? You looked at your neighbor and you said, wow, did you see the house that sold two houses down? Maybe we should sell, right? So navigating when to sell. Um, traditionally, you would look at the spring. And if you're looking at like the calendar year, you would say, okay, spring and fall. Those are the peak times to sell your home and put your home on the market um, because it's the most conducive to getting as an, you know a lot of buyers out to see it. Um, summer, you see, start to see less and less buyers out there. Winter, of course, they're trying to avoid either the weather or holidays. So um, that's something to consider. But that's from a calendar perspective. For me, it's more so, um, you know, a market thing as well. Any questions about the market? I think we're right on schedule here to talk about 
preparing your home for sale, right? So now that we've talked about why people sell homes and what what motivates people to sell homes, let's talk about how to do it. Um, your listing agent is a big part of this. Um, can you do it on your own? Yes, I'll talk about for sale by owner. But um, first, I want to talk about working with an agent. Um, typically, you would work with an agent because they're going to suggest necessary repairs and updates to help you sell your home. They know and see every day what buyers are looking for. So it's easy to get that information from them. Um, they help the seller determine a price. And I say that because most sellers have an idea of what their home is worth. Um, they're lying to you if they don't, right? Most people go to Zillow and Trulia and all these other places. They have some sort of idea of what they want. Um, but they also assist, the, the, the listing agent will assist in getting you in contact with other professionals. Maybe your house might need staging. Maybe you've got clutter. So there's some decluttering that has to happen. You know, this process, it can take some time. The, so I guess the, the bigger picture is that they're helping you with the timeline. Like what will it take to sell your home with the time that you have to do it? Help facilitate the sale of your home. Um, this one's a little more tricky because I know in each state, real estate, the transaction itself is a little different. The, the tools, the documents, the things that you use are different depending on the state and the licensing requirements. So um, all I can say is they help with that facilitation of the offer that you receive, the contract that you go under, and then the process itself. So depending on where you live, that looks a little different. Um, but yeah, like any professional, you want to interview them, right? Treat it like a any like a like a job interview, um, ask them questions, right? What's What relationship will they have not only to your house, but also to you? Uh, what communication style do they have? You know, do they text, email? Um, you know, nowadays, prior to 2020, you could, in, in Georgia specifically, you had to do what's called a wet signature, meaning the person had to be physically there to sign real estate documents. Now you can e-sign, right? Um, so it just depends. Uh, some sellers are not going to be comfortable with e-signing, right? So you as the agent have to know that and know if that style works for you or vice versa. Transaction history. Um, what I'll say about this is, especially, especially in Native communities, you don't want to be somebody's learning curve. Um, if you're a new agent, you should be working with a team so you can rely on other professionals to assist you. So I, I get it when you're new. It's kind of like if anybody, if, if no one takes a chance on me, how am I supposed to learn? And I can, I get that. But I also know if you're a first time selling your home, you're not familiar with the process, which most of our clients will be, I don't want them to be your learning curve, right? Mistakes do happen, things, and and, and really an agent is supposed to protect the seller or, or the listing agent is supposed to protect the seller, buyer's agent protects the buyer. So knowing that I want somebody super qualified to do that work. Um, and then any, they're available to answer questions. Request referrals, you know, ask people who, you know, ask them for referrals. Say, hey, give me a list of three people I can contact to see what kind of work, um, ex what experience they've had with your work. Um, so you can make an informed decision about whether or not they know the area. Um, right now, if I get a client that's asking me about a certain area, I'll refer them to another agent. Um, I don't want to work in certain areas that I'm not familiar with, that I don't know, you know, uh, the area and I can't help them. Um, with that particular market. So I'll refer them to another agent. That's what I would do because I'm a professional, right? Which brings me to my next point. Um, anybody can be licensed as a real estate agent within the state that they reside. So anyone can be licensed. Um, can they do the work just as good as someone who's also uh, a member of, of the Realtor Association? Sure. I'm not advocating that that a person needs to be a realtor in order to be a great professional um, and real estate agent. What I am saying is that a realtor is different. So again, a real estate agent is anyone who's licensed to help people buy and sell real estate. The same is true of a realtor, except that they are also a member of the National Association of Realtors. Um, this group has a strict code of, of ethics. So that's number one. Um, and number two, they provide additional training and resources and support to their agents, right? So they have that next level uh, ability to provide services and resources. Um, and, and they, and, and again, the National Association of Realtors is the largest association in the United States. So they advocate for private property rights, you know, in Washington, they, uh, they just provide so much more in terms of resources. So I will let the client decide what works best for them. But I do think that when you're working with a realtor, 
there are certain benefits that you can weigh. Um, all agents should be able to ascertain the size of the home, the number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, the neighborhood that you reside in, um, you know, age of the home, how many, and when I say neighborhood, how many homes have sold in that neighborhood in the last 30, 60, 90 days, what's currently active in the neighborhood. When I say active, I mean um, that the home is for sale, but it hasn't sold yet. That's considered an active home. And any other, you know, elements that might help, help sell the home, right? A garage, a pool, um, you know, any other structure that's on the home, the, the, the acreage on the home, right? Sample listing presentation. So once you connect with a realtor, that realtor is going to pull that information. Typically, if you're off reservation, that information is available through the county records um, and they'll, they'll get it um, and, make, and make a presentation for you as a seller. And then we talk about your needs, your dreams, your concerns. I need to know these things, your questions, right? So that basically the why of it, I need to know. And I'll also ask about your finances. And here's why. Let's say you have a home and it's worth $250,000. Your current mortgage, you owe $100,000. So when we sell the home, you'll net roughly $150,000. Well, is that enough for what you, your needs or your dreams are, right? We won't know that number unless you give me that information. So uh, going back to working with a professional, this is why, again, the more certifications that they have, the more committed they are to the, to the industry. Um, you know, there's a lot of part-time agents out there and I just don't like it when people are, um, so what I'm looking for, when, when you become their learning curve, right? They don't know everything about your area um, and so they may not do the best job. So if they can do these things and ask these questions, you're on the right track. They also need to know your timeline, right? They need to know what's going on with your life. So you're supposed to be in Phoenix in six months. Well, then this is what this process will look like for you versus someone who says, well, I'm thinking of retiring in two years, right? Um, that That's a different dynamic. As, a, as an agent, I've got to make a decision um, and advocate for you based on what your timeline looks like and what your life looks like. So we always want to take into consideration the the human element to this. This is a home that you worked really hard for. This is where you raised your kids. You know, there's a lot of emotions that come along with selling a home that we need to be aware of. Um, and it's so much better if we had heard this information ahead of time, right? I think just talking to your current homeowners and saying, this is what you're going to feel like is, is a good thing. Um, here are the things that I might, as a realtor, say that I offer to you, right? That I offer photography. I'm going to make sure your listing pictures look great. Um, that you'll have an actual dedicated page that people can go to to see the home, um, both on uh, you know on different sites, right? Zillow, Home, Trulia, Realtor.com, etc. I might pay for advertising, right, on Facebook and Instagram. These are just some of the things I might say. For sure, I'm going to give you a comparative market analysis. That just means I'm going to compare your home to other homes to decide on a price with you. Um, but also, I'm going to negotiate, right? Um, listing agents represent the list represent you, the seller. Uh, now, buyer's agents represent the buyers. I mean, it's as simple as that. So when I negotiate, I negotiate on behalf of the seller. I want you to net as much as possible. I also might say, if you have the time, that these are the elements that add value. You know, there's some people that include, and I'm going to be outrageous and say something like, you know, a bowling alley. Okay, great. You've got a bowling alley in your in your garage. That might be considered over improvement. It works for you. It it's it's fun. It works for your family, but that may not be what someone's looking for as far as selling your home and what they're looking for, right? So sometimes people make improvement and they over improve. They do something that doesn't add value to the home. And so if you're a two bedroom one bath and you go up to a three bedroom, two bath, well, you've added value. A bathroom remodel is typically 70% um, more that we can ask. Um, it, uh, let's see here, where is that additional bedroom? Maybe you be, you finish the basement, that's an extra 60 grand that we can add to the list price, et cetera. So I'm just saying, you know, when you're thinking about as a homeowner, when you're thinking about making a remodeling decision, this can also benefit you uh, from that perspective. And maybe some folks haven't ever thought about it like that. Um, price value versus market value, right? So when you sell your home, I talked a little bit about days on market, 
when you sell your home, you're trying to weigh, right? Uh, pricing your home so that you attract buyers. If you if you if you go too high, an overpriced house will not sell, right? So we want to generate offers by making sure that there's some balance between the price and the market value. So where the two meet, that's where you want to price your home. Another thing I like to show folks is, you know, condition, right? The condition of your home versus the those houses that are very similar to your home, right? So if if none of the homes are similar to your home and you price it at a certain amount and all the other homes don't compare, then you're out of the market. You're out of that range. If you get closer inwards, right? If you look at the price of the, your home and th let's say a third of those homes that are for sale are, are in the same range as your home, you're getting closer. You're still in no man's land, but you're getting there. When you are you know, in the market, 67% or, or better, then the price of your home is going to get or net the most. So let's look at pricing your home. So if you look at this triangle, it says, if I ask for 15 above what is normal in, for my market, only 10% of potential buyers will look at it. If I go at market value, I'm still only getting 60% of the people who should see the home. And think about it from a, a human nature perspective. If I know that the market value is 300 and I um, lower the price to 285, well, now I'm below the market value and 75% of people want to come see it, right? And so on, 15%, 90% of people want to see it. The goal of the, of the, listing agent is to say, well, what would benefit you and what, and, and basically your timeline? Because in some cases I need as many people as humanly possible to see it. Maybe the client has all the time in the world. And so 60% is good enough. It just depends. So let's say your home, we call it the subject home. If your home is three bedrooms, two baths, and it has a new roof, an updated kitchen, and it currently has 1500 square feet, <coughs> excuse me, then I'm going to compare it to other things, right? I've got an active listing, so a house that's for sale in your area. And when I say your area, less than a half a mile away, three bedrooms, but one bath, 1,200 square feet. So it's smaller than your home. Um, what else? It's smaller than your home, and it has one less bathroom. And it doesn't say that the roof has been updated or anything like that. So I'm going to list your home higher than this for sure because we've got an extra bathroom and we've got more square footage. Let's look at just sold. This home sold less than 30 days ago. Three bedroom, two bath, new roof, just like yours. And it also has uh, more square footage, right, than your home. So I'll look at that price and I might say, okay, well, we might not be able to net as much. But let's whatever they listed it for, if it was 250 then I know I'm not too far behind, you know, at... 245 right um because I, I this is why your average sales price per square foot matters right i'll deduct that from here and decide just sold 120 days three bedroom two bath um but it was in disrepair right it had 1500 square feet so the same amount of square footage but there was you know kitchen needed work the bathrooms needed work uh, the roof was crazy old. The HVAC was old. So when I look at this home, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, okay, it it sold for this price. Um, it probably should have sold for a lot more if they had done those repairs, right? So this is an outlier. I may or may not use this in my, in my decision uh, when I talk to my client. But what I am going to give them is the average sales price, right? So these two houses in particular, for sure, um, I'm going to use. And then the average sales price per square foot, this is why this part is so important, is that, you know, people need to know what they're paying per square foot. Um, and then also my recommendation, because I have my idea and then the seller will have their idea. And um, um, typically where the two worlds meet is where we list. So people always ask, well, like, OK, so then what does it cost to sell a home? Well, it depends. In the United States, the average listing fee can range anywhere between 1% and 6%. Um, it's important to note that the client, that the listing agent and the selling agent are splitting that fee. Um, so 
this this isn't like I don't know how to describe it. Um, let me think. Typically, you know, when you work in a company, you're getting paid a certain amount, and that's it's it's set. Um, when you're selling a home and you're a listing agent, you're you're basically saying, I want to bring as many buyers to the table as possible. So I I basically put that number out there that I'm going to split my commission with the buyer's agent in order for the buyer's agent to, to show the property, to come to the table. So that's the relationship. That's how it works. Um, it's unique to, to the, the industry that I'm in. Um, you know, when I first got into real estate, I didn't understand that a whole lot. And I was kind of like, well, this is strange. Well, I can't, I just charge my buyers to be an agent um, and, you know, do it that way. And there are uh, companies that do it that way. Um, it just so happens that the, the industry practice as of right now, not to say it can't change, is that the listing agent is essentially charging for both services, this, both, the, both their services as a listing agent and then the buyer that they're bringing to the table um, will, will get paid based on that commission amount. Um, so that's just how that part works. Um, in terms of for sale by owner, some people can purchase, can, are, are capable, more than capable of selling their home on their own, especially in rural areas. You see that a lot because, you know, they can put a sign out front. There's not many people that go down that road. And so they know that, um, the individuals are, are local, right. And they know everybody, that kind of thing. Um, but you know, in terms of price, a for sale by owner home, typically, I guess this was a 2020 profile of home buyers and sellers. They found the NAR found that um, for sale by owner homes uh, were priced at on average at 225 compared to the median price of 345 when sold by an agent. Right. So that's a difference of one hundred and twenty thousand dollars and protection. Going back to the documents that you use to sell a home and um, when a listing agent represents you they are your agent they are representing you in the transaction they have your best interest or they're supposed to have your best interest that is uh especially if you're a realtor that's a part of the code of ethics to make sure that you're doing best for your client and the same is true of the buyer's agents when you don't have that level of protection um you, you know you do start to see uh people taking advantage of the situation or the negotiation not go in favor of the seller so just be mindful of that Although they might be reducing that fee or, or, or not having to pay that um, listing fee uh, in return, they may not have that level of protection that they need. Um, this is what a listing agent brings to the table as well. They are typically a part of what's called a multiple listing service, meaning they have access to all the homes that are available in, in an area. Um, they have the address, bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, lot size, year built, price per square foot, as I mentioned before. So these are the kind of things we look at. And we also suggest the necessary repairs, as I said, um, any updates. We get you in contact with someone who's going to take pictures of your home. Excuse me. And we also will um, tell you, here's what we want you to do. Make sure that for the pictures specifically, you turn off all your light, turn, excuse me, turn on all your lights, that you adjust your ceiling fans, that you clean your ceiling fans, clean and declutter put personal items away. Um, you know, people want to see a home and envision themselves in it. And if you're all over the place where it's your family and your photos, it can be off-putting. People won't know whether or not, you know, they fit. Does your lifestyle fit in this home? So you're, you're trying to help them envision themselves. Remove things that are you know, maybe uh, a slip and fall situation. So throw rugs, um, et cetera. Plus you want to be able to show off the floors. Um, adjust your furniture so that it's welcoming. Um, and then also clearing off countertops, things like that. Personal items and personal information. We want to make sure we're removing certain things like that, but also hide wires, cables, remotes. We want to make it look very clean and crisp. Um, the exterior, you want to cut and blow your yard off, your driveway, your patios, your decks. Um, I like to add fresh mulch or pine straw. It just gives the house a fresh look. Um, Going back to that spending plan, it costs money to sell your home, like in the, in the sense of you might have to pay a little bit to do these things, right? Get get your grass cut, get um, some landscaping, minor landscaping done to, to, to make sure it shines. This is also what they call curb appeal. Remove the trash cans and the lawn equipment from the yard. Um, remove debris and other things like that. 
your patio should look like you're expecting someone, right? So the pillows are on there and it just looks welcoming. Um, keeping pets and also pets, they've got a lot of swag, right? They've got the beds and the, and the toys and all these other things. So try to keep pets and, and their accessories out of the way. Um, because you might be a dog person, but maybe the person who's buying it might be a cat person, right? And so you don't want to, you don't want them to just negate your home from their their thought process. Um, and then you can use your garage or pantry or other things to to um, store these things, but be careful because just because they're not being photographed doesn't mean people aren't going to take a look at it. Um, and so having these things ready before the photo the the photographer arrives is huge. Partly because the photographer is there to take pictures, not to do any of this work, right? So every once in a while, they might move a, you know, if you've got dish soap on the counter, they might put it in the sink, you know, put it in the sink or put it underneath to hide it from, from showing up in the picture. But, you know, in general, they won't do any of this work. So if you get a picture back and it looks really bad, I mean, it's kind of too late. They've already taken those pictures, right? And you as the seller are paying for it, potentially. So you want to make sure your house shines. So now we're going to talk about the contract to close part of this, right? So you did your due diligence. You hired a great professional to be your agent. They've listed your home. You've decided on a price and someone has decided to accept your price, the price that you listed your home for. So now you're under what they call contract. You, there's a lot of planning that takes place while you're under contract. Usually the first hurdle is the inspection, right? The buyer is going to send someone to the home. They're going to you know, look at the major structures of the home. Um, they're not going to tell you, oh, the carpet needs to be replaced. They might notice the stains, et cetera. But, you know, they're not in it. The inspection report's not in it for the cosmetics. They want to make sure that the house is safe, sanitary, and sound. So what they're looking for are the mechanics. Is your HVAC working properly? What's the life of this roof that you've got? Useful life of that. Um, and by useful life, I mean, how long is it still uh going to be uh, protecting you and your and your valuables, like as far as your HVAC system, right? How long is it before it stops working? That's the useful life of a, of a, a that's the, the definition of useful life is how long will this thing stay um, operational, effective, and, and stay in an acceptable condition, right? So um, they'll give you typically the useful life, what's left of the, of the item. I have seen it where like a furnace it works, but it's past its useful life, right? So me as the seller may say, well, look, this, the furnace works. It may be past its useful life, but I'm not replacing it. So these are the kind of things that the home inse inspection will, will uh, reveal. And once there's uh, an inspection, the, aid, the buyer's agent, remember the buyer's the one who paid for this report, will tell the listing agent what the, the buyer wants to have repaired the seller can agree or disagree. So home inspection is definitely that first hurdle. Once you move past that, maybe the seller agrees to fix something, maybe they don't. But either way, if the buyer still wants to move forward, well, then we're now in still under contract and we're moving into that next phase. So of course there's list price, right? There's offer price and there's appraisal price. I'm going to start with list price. That's what I've been talking about this entire time. It's what the seller and the agent have decided uh, will move the home uh, and sell the home at a certain price. We talked about whether that price is too high or too low and what that will do to the number of people who are interested in it. But then there's the offer price. It's what people will offer for your home. Maybe it's the same as list. Maybe it's higher. Maybe it's lower. Just depends. Once, it, once you're under contract, the best way to put this is that the bank is never going to lend you more than the home is worth, right? So if the bank is never going to lend you more than the home is worth, then they're going to have it appraised to ensure that that's the case. That's your appraisal price. They're going to look at the neighborhood, any improvements, going back to those renovations. They're going to look at the condition. What's the useful life of everything? How's the house? How, you know, is it is there a slant, right? Is there some sort of foundation issue I need to worry about? They're going to look at the age and they're going to look at the market and they're going to come up with the property value. So an appraisal is a separate entity. It's a person that will come out um, sent by the lender to appraise the current market value and make sure the value is there. No bank is going to sell you more than home is, is going to lend you more than the home is worth. So that's the best way of looking at it.
And the seller's not buying that appraisal report. It, it comes from the, the buyer side. Um, now, comparison analysis. Does that mean that the, the seller might have an appraisal report? It's not like you can't buy one independently um, because maybe they want to have that information. But typically, you see it from the buyer side. So we're going to compare. We're going to take all this information I've been talking about and we're going to compare uh, apples to apples, right? So here's an example of an appraisal report. Um, and so you've got this address right here on the left. And if you look down, that's considered your subject property. Then you got comparable number one, number two, and number three. And so essentially, if you go down the line, you're essentially looking at all the differences between the two and they're making adjustments, right? So um, this is going to determine whether or not this pro uh, property, property A or subject is where it needs to be as far as the appraisal is concerned. And for you, if you're on res, excuse me, if you're on reservation, then what you need to know is they won't use the comparison model, right? So if I don't have three houses, even in this case, the house was in Dallas, Georgia, area code three zero one three two. Um, the next houses that were available were one point five miles, one point six miles, one point eight miles. So not you know, terribly close. I mean, with, they were with, within two miles of each other, but still that's, that's kind of far, far off, right? So it just, they weren't even in the same zip code. That's how far apart these homes were. Um, and that's for because of that, the way the neighborhood uh, is there. In your location, you know, it might be closer, it might be further away. Um, but when you don't have any homes to compare, well, then you've got to use the cost approach. So appraisers will say, okay, definitely for new construction, because they have nothing to compare it to, and, and if you're on reservation with new construction, they definitely don't have anything to compare it to. So they'll say, well, how much would it cost to replace the structure using the cost estimator, right? So this is how much I paid for the lumber. This is how much I paid for the windows. This is how much it's costing me per square foot for these items. And then I'll come up with the number of that. Any questions about um, the cost approach? I uh, check this. Let's see. I check the chat. Nothing there. Okay, cool. So, title work on fee simple land, which is what we call land off reservation, um, or you know, not a part of an allotment or not a part of a part of tribal trust. Uh, then a title company or a title attorney. Um, they've got different names depending on where you where you live. It might be called different things. But the role of the title company is to make sure that the person selling the home has the right to sell the home. Um, once they have that confirmed, then they might they'll, they might offer the, the buyer some title insurance, ensuring that their work is correct. But essentially, that's what that means. Um, the title company's role is to make sure that the home that you're selling, that you have the right to do so as the seller. And if problems are found, it can hold up closing um, until it's fixed. I, I had a client once that he purchased a home and then later he found out that there was actually, it, it was the sale of the parent's home and that there were two siblings, not one. And so both siblings had to, had to sign the documentation. Um, so they fixed it. They had the other person sign. It's not that they didn't know about it. They just didn't happen to list them, you know, in the contract information. So once the title company fi found that out, they let us know. And us as agents had to go ahead and, and, and click, get that cleaned up. If you're on tribal trust, then you already know that you have to get a certified status, tribal status report, also known as the TSR. Um, and that's what shows proof of the seller of the land. Um, and then, of course, the package that the lender sends has to have the application for the mortgage, the appraisal, and the tribal status report included in that. So it's a little bit more... Um, complicated as as it was said by one of the lenders when i asked them about this process but you know is something that can be done and it is done um, on tribal trust land as well as off so um a lot of times you hear well we don't have a, a a market you know what i mean there's no one wanting to sell their home but the argument is you know if and when that situation occurs did, you know at least they know more about the process and i know that some Tribal communities have a realty office versus others who do like a land management location. And, and so some of this is done by the BIA and also by the land management office. So, you know, detail what that process looks like. 
go to, you know, if you're a housing authority or a TDHE, find that information out and just have it available for folks so they know where to go and who to talk to. So of course you want to create a moving plan because uh, your house is under contract <laughs> and within 30 to 45 days, this house will no longer belong to you. So you need to have a plan to pack and move your belongings. I have had it happen where um, I was a buyer's agent, person went to buy the home and the day of closing, the sellers were not ready. None of their stuff had been removed. Now it was an elderly couple and they needed help. You know, they needed support. They thought they could do it on their own and they couldn't. You know what I mean? So, I mean, agents' roles are to help each other out. And so when the agent told me that, I, you know, I sprung into action. And between the two of us, we came up with a plan for their sellers because my buyers were, you know, they were excited to move into their home. But, you know, we also didn't want to toss these people's stuff out on the street, right? So we have to come up with a solution and a plan. So it's always best if we can do that ahead of time. Get quotes from movers, right? Compare prices, find the best deal, pack your belongings. This could take time. Um, you know, it's hard to it's hard to spring clean. So imagine moving an entire house, right? Especially if this is, uh, if you're downsizing, you've got more stuff than you have house. Your new house is not going to be able to hold the amount of stuff you have um, in your current house. Dispose of unwanted items, right? So donating, selling, recycling, this is a huge part of the process. So at closing, closing is also called settlement for some people, just depends on where you're at. Um, but the final step is the closing. At the closing, the buyer signs all the documents and pays the seller the agreed price, uh, you're right? So that's, that's where that settlement comes into play. The seller will then sign over the deed uh, of the property or any sort of um, documents that the seller needs to sign, they'll do it there. And then they'll receive their proceeds. Now, it's 2023, I was about to say 13, gosh. It's 2023. Um, most sellers receive what's called um, a wire transfer. They're not getting a check and walking away with a check. They're they're getting it sent to their um, to the, directly to their bank. What I will say is that we really need to be careful with that and protect our sellers. Make sure they're working closely with the with the title company or the closing attorney or who's whoever is responsible for receiving those um, those wiring instructions. There are bad guys that look target emails that say uh, closing or closing day or closing settlement or any of that. And once they they find that information, they can sometimes intercede and email the seller and say, OK, give me your wiring information. And then now they're instead of the seller getting those proceeds, those proceeds end up in the wrong hands. So another thing to do to protect your clients is let them know if they're in the process of selling their home, they need to make sure that that they check their um, email for um, the right, whoever's supposed to be connecting with them, you know, regarding those, those, those numbers. Um, they should bring a copy of their driver's license or some other form of uh, issue, government issued ID, the keys to the home, right? So I always advise my buyers to change the locks, but I still want the keys to the home. Um, it's just part of it is symbolic, right? You're transferring the home, you're, you're signing the documents, bring the keys to the home so that the new homeowner has those. Oh, also garage fobs. I would not, cannot tell you how many times I've walked away from a transaction and someone's like, hey, how do I get into the garage? So make sure they give you the garage keys as well. Um, sale contract or wire information. Again, your your agent, if they're good at what they do, they'll protect you and make sure you have, they have those documents with them as well. But if you have it with you, that's fine too. And then anything else that the, the, attorney or closing agent requires. And of course, be able to ask questions or answer questions. Um, so a lot of times the new owners and the, the new homeowners and the old homeowners are sitting at the same table and, you know, they'll ask like, hey, you know, what's the summer like? If you're buying in the winter, what's the summer like? Um, I'll never forget my, I purchased a home. The, the seller said to me, be careful when you're outside first thing in the morning you might want to have your coffee on the back porch. That door locks automatically. Meaning when you walk out there for your morning coffee, you might just lock yourself out of the house. <laughs> Invaluable. I mean, yes, I changed the locks, but the thought process that first, I didn't do it for like a good week and a half, two weeks. And I did lock myself out of the house. So it just goes to show you, it's good for them to chit chat and learn more about the house, you know, learn more about, um, you know, things they loved about the house, things to be, you know, mindful of, maybe that 
you know, every, every spring, you know, a bird comes back or something like that. You never know, but um, be prepared to answer questions. Be prepared to move out. As I said before, this is key. Make sure all your stuff is ready to go. Um, and also be patient because the process does take time. Sometimes the buyer's side, there things pop up, right? So you as the seller, you're ready to sell your house, but the buyer, maybe something comes up and their lender can't, can't close on that day, right? Um, going back to the closing disclosure or the loan estimate, that document has to be in the buyer's hand three days before closing. If it's not there three days before closing, you cannot close. That is a federal, that is a law, uh, or, a, or at least I know for a fact that the, the, from a financing perspective, the, the lender cannot move forward. So it's one of those things where you want to make sure that you're patient because sometimes you don't close when you originally plan to. Um, but then you're all done. Congratulations on the sale of your home. Don't sleep just yet. There's a few other things you need to do, right? And so if you're off reservation, um, you know, you settled and your municipality, your county, your city, or whoever got their taxes. But from the larger perspective, right? And this is both on and off reservation. Um, you may be eligible for capital gains tax deduction if you've owned a home, home and lived in your home for at least two to of the five years before the sale of your home, you'll be able to exclude up to $250,000 of the gain from your taxable income if you're single and if you're married, that number is up to 500. So it just depends. Um, I'm not a tax professional. That part is, is true. So, you know, you'd have to look into this more closely, but, you know, that's just one option that's available to you, especially if you're going to purchase a new home. And then don't forget to cancel your homeowner's insurance and utilities. Um, you don't want to duplicate services. You have to make sure that you've canceled uh, certain things, that you've updated your address. You know, I can't tell you people will call and say, hey, your client's stuff is still showing up here at the house, that kind of thing. And it could be, it, you know, doctor's offices and others just don't have that new information. Um, so using your home to for the proceeds of another home um, is an option. So you sell your home to buy another home. Um, then of course you need to make sure that you have those funds available. Make sure that you can use it for other options like debt and in investing, saving for retirement, right? Um, if you're downsizing, you get a smaller place. Uh, you might put that money aside and say, this is my retirement money. Um, and then don't forget to enjoy the moment. Selling your home is a big change, but it also means an opportunity for a fresh start. So with that, any other questions that anyone might have for me, I'm open to, uh, to, to just giving you more information on the selling of a home and that whole process. Any questions? Well, I appreciate having had the time with you here today. That's my contact information. So if you have, um, let's see here, I think, All right. If there are any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll, I'll take a look. In the meantime, that's my contact information. Those are the other trainings I provide. Um, so there is a question. It says, we thought about selling by owner, but I think using a realtor is probably best. I would say it's worth at least looking into. Um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to uh, a transaction. Um, and I also think to uh, finding out uh, more information from other agents um, is, is a good start. Now, I be careful online because I do know once you select, once you say you're interested in selling your home, you're going to get tons of mail from different um, places and spaces. So be careful with that. Um, but you can do your own research and make a decision that works best for you and your family. That'd be great. I'm, th I'm thankful that you are on today and that you gained some knowledge um, regarding the process. It, you know, it, I, to me, it reminds me of like, you know, I have two boys and um, I, I had a stroller for them, sure. But if you asked me to open a stroller today, I probably wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> and so I do feel like sometimes, even if you've gone through the process, it changes. So there's that element to, to, to this process as well. Um, so Rebecca says, when seeking a home you've lived, when selling a home, you've lived in for 20 years, how much remodeling should you do before selling? So I really think it depends on the condition of the home um, and what's 
going on in your market, right? So if the majority of your homes that are selling for the price that you're interested in selling for have an updated bathroom, updated kitchen, well, then, yeah, that's going to have an effect on whether or not you can sell your house for that same amount. Um, so, so, but 20 years is, is a long time. Trends change. You know, most people now are used to farm, farmhouse modern thanks to Chip and Joanna Gaines. And so that's typically what, you know, buyers want to see. They want to see agreeable gray, um, similar to my presentation. They want, they, they like those colors. They're soothing. Will that change in 20 years? Probably. Um, so, I would say you got to do your research there on on what currently I would take the last 30, 60 days and see what's sold in your area and what those homes look for that are very similar to yours. OK, so someone's saying our house was built in 1937. Well, you are very lucky because those homes are amazing. And, I, you know, the historical value of, of that home, I think besides the financial aspect, it's just the history. Um, you know, I, I see some of the houses with the scallops and things like that here around town where I'm from, and I just admire them so much. So um, I love an old home. <laughs> that is true. Now, if I could get my husband to remodel for me for free, that'd be great. <laughs> I mean, even even myself, I find myself, you know, having a hard time getting a contractor because he's so busy. Um, so cool. It's a farmhouse uh, built in 1937. That's amazing. Um, but I'm sure there are things that you might want to have updated. So check out the selecting um, selecting a home, uh, your home selecting a, a housing professional. I think that one would be a good one um, to know, at least to make sure you're selecting the right type of uh, contractor for the work done in a home like that. So with that, I'm going to toss it back over to the NLC. Um, again, I appreciate the time and the opportunity. Thank you so much. Oh, we totally appreciate it. I enjoyed it. I, you know, as, as a person who buys homes, this is a great 101 session. I'm, I'm sure everybody learned some really great stuff. And as always, it's always good to see uh, friends and family come back home to enjoy themselves. <laughs> yes, this is definitely home base. I don't know that I can afford Hollywood, Florida anymore, but it's nice to know I have a place to crash. That's okay. See, that's good. That's good. All right. Let me actually. Uh, I've dropped the survey link into the chat. So if you could do us a please a huge favor and fill out the survey link, that's very, very important to us. It's how we get our information so we know if we're doing a great job or if we need to do more things or do less things. So that's basically it. So let me see what do we still. Oh, we've gone through. I forgot to do my little part is go through the actual outline. And I get us all the way to the end, so cover our last little bits. And of course, if you want the PDF, it is available for for download in the fields folder. So you can grab this entire PDF and you can use it when you want to sell your home. That's today's survey. Our next webinar is June 20th, uh, section 184 home loan review. Of course, uh, Miss Bonville will be doing another one of these. That's I believe that is Tuesday, and it will be, of course, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, 12 p.m. Mountain, and 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific. And you can access any of our recorded webinars at our website at nativelearningcenter.com. Just look for the Gafita online link, and you can go and sign up. You can check out any of our upcoming events on our Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. You can also check out our uh, Hobothinga Native American podcast available at all um, podcast locations, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Or you can go to directly at to Simplecast and listen to it there. As always, thank you so much for stopping by. We really appreciate it. And you all have a lovely day.